Here we'll talk about phylum chordata, the larger group of deuterostomes. Chordates are all deuterostomes coelomates. They are the nearest relatives of the echinoderms, which can be kind of hard to believe, but they both truly have an internal endoskeleton. Now, chordates do have muscles attached to that endoskeleton, and because of that, larger animals are possible. Chordates include fishes, amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals, as well as two other non-vertebrate phyla. There are four features that are characteristic of chordates. They're evolutionary important, and they're present at least at some point in development. Those are, number one, the nerve cord, a dorsal hollow nerve cord. In vertebrates, this turns into the brain and the spinal cord. Number two, the notochord. This is a flexible rod just below the nerve cord. In vertebrates, this is replaced by the vertebral column. Number three, pharyngeal gill slits that connect the pharynx to the external environment, allowing water into the pharynx for feeding. These turn into pharyngeal pouches in terrestrial vertebrates, and there's no external trace of them. They turn into what are called the eustachian tubes. This um, is not visible from the outside, and they're not functional, but they do point at the aquatic ancestry that we all share. Number four, all chordates have a post-anal tail, at least during embryonic development, if nothing else. This is going to help with locomotion in aquatic chordates and with balance and communication in terrestrial chordates. All chordates have all four of these characteristics at some point in their lives. So again, they might disappear by the time the organism is born or matures, but at some point, all chordates will have these. There are some other characteristics that distinguish chordates from other animals. Muscles are arranged in segmented blocks called somites. Most chordates have an internal skeleton against which the muscles can work, and this is going to increase their capacities for movement. Phylum chordata can be divided into three subphyla. Those are urochordata, cephalochordata. These phyla consist of organisms with no bones, no vertebrate, and then the vertebrata. So this is a prototypical chordate, right? So you can see the features that distinguish chordates from other animals, like the notochord, the dorsohalar nerve cord that's running down the back of the organism, the pharyngeal gill slits, the postanal tail, and then additionally you can see the somites here, or the muscle blocks that are connected to that um, notochord and there are any other elements of the skeleton. Also, complete digestive system. So first subphylum we're going to look at is subphylum urochordata, <clears throat> which includes tunicates and salps. These are marine animals uh, found mostly in shallow waters all over the world. These are hermaphroditic organisms. Um, eggs hatch into larvae in adults. The larvae are tadpole-like in that they have a motile tail, plus notochord, nerve cord, pharyngeal gill slits, all the features that chordates possess. These larvae are free swimming, but they don't feed. They just hang out like this for a few days, looking for a suitable substrate, and once they find one, they attach to it with a sucker. Once they attach to it, they turn into an adult, and the adult looks quite different. They usually lose the tail, the notochord, the nerve cord. They are not uh, motile at all. They're immobile filter feeders that use cilia in the pharynx in order to filter out small bits of organic matter from the water. Um, they also don't have any visible muscle segments or any major body cavity, right? So they're quite primitive looking once they turn into adults. In addition to that, many will secrete a cellulose sac called a tunic, which is quite remarkable. Cellulose is uh, unusual in animals. This completely surrounds the organism um, to protect it. So this is the larva right here, and as you can see, it looks pretty motile. It looks like a tadpole, 
But then here we see the adult. So it's a huge contrast here. Um, and the adult, again, looks pretty darn primitive. It doesn't look like a whole lot of other animals that we know. But when we look at that juvenile, that larva, um, that points to the um, neurocodata, the tunicates themselves, being the common ancestor of all chordates. These are all tunicates up here, um, sea squirt, and then this is the salp, which is a kind of a clear looking organism. Subphylum cephalochordata, the most common member here is the lancelet. These are all small, scaleless chordates, uh, about a few centimeters tops. These guys do have a notochord cord that persists throughout the animal's whole life. Uh, it runs the length of the dorsal hollow nerve cord, which also persists throughout the organism's entire life. Um, however, these organisms don't have a distinguishable head. The head pretty much looks like the tail end, even though it is a little bit different if you look very closely at it. There's a mouth and light receptors towards the head end of the organism. Cephalochordates do have muscles that are organized into somites or blocks, so they can swim, but they don't swim very much. They spend most of their time partially buried in sediment, and they use um, cilia in order to generate a current with which to filter feed. Right? So they're also fairly sedentary, even though they look more like uh, something like a fish, a typical chordate. These are the closest relatives to vertebrates based on their structures as well as fossil and molecular data. Most chordates, certainly most of the chordates we're familiar with, are in subphylum vertebrata, which is named for the vertebrae, right? The vertebrae that make up the spinal column. There are other features that distinguish this subphylum from other chordates and other animals in general. The first most obvious is that vertebral column, which protects and houses that dorsal hollow nerve cord, either with cartilaginous or bony vertebral bones. Um, vertebrae also have um, a head, a distinct head, that's well differentiated with complex sensory organs, organs and a protective cranium. They're also going to have a neural crest, which is a unique group of embryonic cells that differentiate from the neural tube. And they go on to form many important vertebrate structures like cartilage, bone, muscle, and nervous tissue. Vertebrates also have many complex internal organs like the liver, kidneys, endocrine glands that secrete hormones, a heart that pumps through a closed circulatory system. This circulatory system and excretory system, the kidneys, are particularly um, unique to vertebrates and very different from other animals. Finally, we got an endoskeleton, internal skeleton made out of cartilage or bone. This is going to make it possible for these animals to get much bigger than other animals and also allows for their extraordinary movement. Right, um, great capacity for complex movements. So this diagram from your book shows a lot of these characteristic features. We got that distinct head end here, um, vertebral column, which houses that dorsal nerve cord, and then a lot of these internal organs, right, that are unique to vertebrates, like this heart powering the circulatory system. Looking at vertebrate evolution, the first vertebrates appeared in oceans, so they're aquatic, about 545 million years ago during a time um, called the Cambrian period. These were jawless fish that looked like a flattened hot dog, basically, with a mouth at one end and a fin at the other. Soon, jawed fishes became more dominant. They have a hinged jaw that allowed them new feeding options. From jawed fishes, we get the amphibians, which invaded the land. And then reptiles took off, replacing amphibians as the dominant land vertebrate because they were better adapted to terrestrial life. After the reptiles, at the same time, around 65 million years ago, when dinosaurs went extinct, birds and mammals became more dominant. At this point, vertebrates really dominant 
the terrestrial environment. They're very diverse, small, large. They can fly, they can swim, they can run. So this is our um, phylogeny of vertebrates. Right? There's some key evolutionary um, adaptations that took place here, like the head, evolution of the head, right? the evolution of the vertebral column, and then to really allow these vertebrates to invade the land, we got legs, right? As well as what's called the amniotic egg, which we'll talk about later on. But this is an enclosed egg that is analogous to the seed in plants. It allows for protection and it allows for some development to take place um, with some resources uh, housed within that egg. Of all of these um, classes of organisms, fish and reptiles are paraphyletic. Some fish are more closely related to terrestrial vertebrates than they are to other fish, and some reptiles are actually more closely related to birds than other reptiles.